This is Rebecca Breitfeller. Today's episode is titled, Top 10 South Park Episodes. This article was written by Carrie Fishbane. I'm going down to South Park, gonna have myself a time. Friendly faces everywhere, humble folks without temptation. I'm about to tell you something you might never hear again from a fresh out of college PC SJW. I love South Park. I'm a degree holder, Phi Beta Kappa, and I freaking love one of the stupidest and most offensive shows on TV. Nay, in TV history. There are probably others like me out there who are just too afraid to admit it. South Park is a bit of a dirty word in polite society. Everyone knows it's one of the most raunchy and vulgar shows on TV, while simultaneously revolving around a group of elementary school students. What you might not realize is that it is also an incredibly intelligently written show that never fails to make biting commentary on whatever the hot button issue of the day is. Also, the fart jokes are funny. <laughs> Stop it, Carmen! Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> South Park has gifted us with over 300 episodes and 23 seasons and it's my job to sift through all of them and tell you the best of the best. If you are offended by any of the items on the list, all I can offer you is a solemn, okay. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 10, Sexual Harassment Panda, Season 3, Episode 6. Say hi to Sexual Harassment Panda. Hi, Sexual Harassment Panda. We start our list with perhaps the episode with the strangest title. Sexual Harassment Panda tells the story of what happens when Cartman finds out he can sue Kyle for a comment that he considers sexual harassment. Long story short, the whole town goes bankrupt. To be clear, sexual harassment is a real and serious thing. The episode is in no way arguing that it's not. But filing a lawsuit over an eight-year-old calling you an A-sucker might be a bit much. Here. I think sexual harassment panda is cute. You would think that, you little ass sucker. What did you call me? An ass sucker. It means you suck ass. You see an ass and you suck it. You're an ass sucker. That does it! I am suing you for sexual harassment! In the episode, every resident of South Park becomes obsessed with filing frivolous lawsuits, which in turn bankrupts everyone. The lawsuits become so out of hand that in the end, there's a case dubbed everyone versus everyone. Then call me, Kyle's dad, and I'll help you close the lid on sexual harassment in school. Kyle's dad, Gerald, playing the part of the greedy lawyer, accepts the job of defending both everyone and everyone. This episode is an excellent example of the brilliant commentary on society that is laced throughout all the greatest episodes of South Park. It starts with just Cartman being a greedy a-hole but when he wins his case and reaps the benefits of suing Kyle, suddenly everyone in his class wants to jump on the bandwagon. After a boy in my class tried to put his tongue in my mouth, I knew I needed legal help. Kyle's dad helped me get a $1.6 million settlement and this bright new shiny bicycle. Thank you, Kyle's dad. Then Gerald comes in, sees his potential benefit of this fad, and fans the flames. Then everyone sues everyone. Tomorrow's trial, everyone versus everyone, is gonna make things a lot worse, we have to stop it! This episode questions the extent of human greed and what it will take before people finally come to their senses. In this case, that happens when a panda meant to teach kids about sexual harassment, as pandas are known to do in nature, becomes a panda who warns everybody about the danger of frivolous lawsuits. Sexual harassment. <laughs> Come on down to South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 9. Chef's Chocolate Salty Balls. Season 2, Episode 9. Like Sexual Harassment Panda, 
This episode's title is really weird and difficult to explain when I have just a few paragraphs to cover the entire episode. No, this episode is not about Chef's sexual reawakening. The first annual South Park Film Festival a success. We've barely even started and already the festival has seen more attendance than last year's Sundance Festival. The Sundance Film Festival comes to South Park and brings all its hyper-pretentious vegan attendees with it. This upsets the sewer ecosystem of Mr. Hanky and the Christmas Poo, who is used to the results of the lower class diets of South Parkians feeding his habitat. It's up to the boys to save him. My best friend Mr. Hanky is getting sick because South Park has become overcrowded with people who eat health food. Excuse me, little boy, what's a Mr. Hanky? And somewhere in the midst of it, Chef sells a candy he dubbed his chocolate salty balls. Through the roof. I call them Chef's Salty Chocolate Balls. South Park has been known to tackle the issue of gentrification, particularly in season 19, with Sheep Todd Town replacing the shitty part of town. We are going to build a Hollywood Planet restaurant right here where this library used to stand. But this season two episode was an early commentary on the subject before it became the hot topic of discussion that it is today. We learned that these rich Hollywood people who run Sundance invade poorer areas to add some small town charm to the festival, but in ecosystems of sentient poo. If there's a better argument against gentrification out there besides its potential to kill Mr. Hanky, I'd like to hear it. Dude, no one even listened to me. You know, it does sound like a pretty sweet movie. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 8. Scott Tennerman Must Die Oh, it won't be so dumb when Scott Tennerman arrives. I suggest you stay to see the fireworks. Oh, we will. Trust us, we wouldn't miss this. If you want to see the extent of Cartman's depravity, Look no further than the episode in which he fed a kid his own parents because he pulled a childish prank on him. The episode begins with ninth grader Scott Tennerman selling Cartman his pubic hair because Cartman doesn't understand that when he gets older, he will grow his own. How do you like them apples? Ha! What are those? My pubes. What? I got them from Scott Tennerman. Scott Tennerman? The ninth grader? Yep, he let me have them for just 10... Cartman spends the rest of the episode plotting his revenge on his poor, unsuspecting victim. The plot begins unorganized and simple, such as plotting for a pony to bite Scott's wiener off, but eventually gets to the point where Cartman feeds Scott Mrs. and Mr. Tennerman chili. Do you like it? Do you like it, Scott? I call it Mr. and Mrs. Tennerman chili. If you thought Cartman was a psycho before watching this episode, you haven't seen anything yet. This episode shows the duality of Cartman as we see both his childish naivety when he falls for Scott's prank and the psychotic future serial killer within him. If you feel like an a-hole at any given time, at least you haven't forced anyone to cannibalize their own parents. I hope. Oh, the tears of unfathomable sadness. Mm, yummy. That's all, folks. Jesus Christ, dude. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 7. Freemium Isn't Free. Season 18, Episode 6. In Season 18, South Park got real about addiction in the only way South Park knows how. Okay, I need help. There is something different about me, you guys. I know the game is stupid, and it actually isn't even fun anymore. I don't understand. Stan gets addicted to a crappy Canadian app game, which forces him to spend a ridiculous amount of money to advance through the game. We learn that the game was put out by the Canadian Minister of Mobile Gaming, who was influenced by the Canadian Devil. Why Canada gets their own devil is anyone's guess. I'm much worse than the devil. I'm the Canadian Devil! <laughs> but this is South Park, so logic hardly matters. But if you've ever wanted to see an epic battle between the Canadian Devil and the normal, global Devil, then this is your episode. Well, well, my overachieving doppelganger! You're no match for Canadian Satan! 
Return from whence you came! This episode features smart commentary on addiction and hypocrisy as Randy tells Stan to get over his addiction while simultaneously downing six glasses of wine paired with German lagers. Or to quote Randy, it's called a tasting and it's classy. Well, what about you? You're having a glass of wine. I'm not having a glass of wine. I'm having six. It's called a tasting and it's classy. People love to point out others' flaws, but not so much their own. The most hilarious scene in the episode is when Stan calls on the Canadian devil and they have a one-on-one -on -one talk about addiction, which resembles a dad-son discussion in a very special episode. You mean I, I can get addicted to everything so I can't enjoy anything? Yeah, that's pretty much what it means. You've seen the devil spiting God and damning all of humanity, but now see him as you've never seen him before, leading a comforting talk like a college RA. Your turn, Grandpa. If you roll a five or six, you can kill these zombies. You guys want to put some money on it? Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number six. It's Christmas in Canada. Season seven, episode 15. It was nearly impossible to pick between South Park holiday episodes. They are all masterpieces in their own right. And I have to give a shout out to Woodland Critter Christmas and Mr. Hankey's Christmas Classics. But ultimately, I had to give the spot to It's Christmas in Canada. Kyle's adopted brother Ike is taken back by his birth parents after the Canadian Prime Minister decides that all children adopted from Canada must be returned to their birth parents. It's been a week since Ike's been gone, and every day my parents seem worse. I have to try to go to Canada and speak with the new Canadian Prime Minister, but I can't do it alone. The boys travel to Canada to get him back. South Park has never been shy about stereotyping Canadians, but they really didn't pull any punches in this episode. We're in Canada! Well, of course you are! And Canada Friends welcomes you! The entire episode is a raunchier and stupider version of The Wizard of Oz. The boys meet the Canadian equivalent of Munchkins, and Scott, for whom the only possible character description is a dick, functions as the Wicked Witch. Who's that? That's Scott! He's a dick! Aha! Uh -huh. Americans! I should have known! You think you're the police of the world! You think you own Canada! Well, you aren't welcome here! Get out now! Uh the boys encounter a Mountie who wants to ask the PM for more funding as he is forced to ride cheap sheep instead of horses, a French-Canadian mime who wants to legalize wine, which has been banned for some reason or other, and a Newfoundlander who wants to legalize sodomy. See what I mean when I say this episode is unkind to Canadians? The episode is also one of the few in the series with a warm and fuzzy ending when Kyle is reunited with Ike and takes him home despite the boys missing out on the usual Christmas festivities while in Canada. However, in proper South Park fashion, in the very last seconds of the episode, Cartman complains about missing out on presents and Kyle punches him till he cries. A Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. Oh well, maybe we'll get to have a Christmas adventure next year. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 5. A Million Little Fibers. Season 10, Episode 5. Towley is one of the best supporting characters in all of the South Park universe. He's a sentient, anthropomorphic towel who is perpetually hot. What's not to love? In this episode, Towley writes a book that publishers refuse to publish because it was written by a towel. Don't bother. I'm sorry to tell you this, sir, but nobody's ever going to publish your memoirs. Huh? Why not? Towley then replaces all the towel-related words in the book, and it immediately becomes a bestseller. All my life, I've been a pretty irresponsible town. Person. But it's a huge scandal when the public finds out that groundbreaking author Stephen McTowley is actually a towel. This is a simultaneously completely stupid and completely brilliant episode. The episode parodies the story of the release of A Million Little Pieces by James Frey. In the true story, a website called Smoking Gun revealed James Frey to have fabricated the true stories in his book. In this episode, 
Okra's sentient lady parts exposed Tally's autobiography as false. Such is the way of South Park. I'm standing in the business district of central Chicago, where Oprah's vagina has killed a police officer and taken several people hostage. This episode is so ridiculously funny, and it is a great example of absurdism in the South Park universe. The social commentary is buried under all of Tally's antics, but it's brilliant. The episode is an eerie reminder of people's tendency towards becoming a hive mind as people all rush to get Towley's book just because Queen Bee Oprah said so. So Stephen, I'm making your book my official book of the month selection! Really? None of them think enough for themselves to notice the fact that there might be something up with an author who wears a clearly fake mustache and whose last name is frickin' McTowley. They just trust Oprah. Yet, when everyone realizes Towley is indeed a towel, instead of blaming themselves for not noticing the obvious signs pointing towards Towley's rather towel-esque features, or blaming their queen bee who they put their trust in, they do what hive minds do best, and form an angry mob to get revenge on Towley. No one has anything against Oprah, and South Park was much kinder to her than they are to some of the other celebrities they parody, but she was used in this episode to prove a point. Now, I'm gonna get super rich now! Come on down South Park and meet some friends, man. Number 4. Margaritaville. Season 13, Episode 3. What happens when economics becomes a religion? If we're talking about South Park, everyone starts wearing bed sheets and kids are forced to play with rocks and sticks instead of expensive video games. So saith the economy. This is a 9 News special report. Recession, a nation in peril. An economic crisis has hit South Park and the nation like never before. When an economic crisis hits, the citizens of South Park, led by Stan's dad, Randy, begin to view the economy as a vengeful god who one must spend conservatively to appease. This is until Kyle comes along and preaches that people must spend for the economy to work. All feeling the economy's vengeance because of materialistic heathens who did stupid things with their money. Do you understand, son? Yeah, I think I get it. The whole plot of this episode is framed to represent the story of Jesus with Randy playing the religious authority, Kyle playing Jesus, and the kids of the town playing his disciples. The moral of the story is that money controls most people's lives enough to become a god, especially during a recession. Faith is what makes an economy exist. Without faith, it is only plastic cards and paper money. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 3. The Imagination Land Trilogy. Season 11, Episode 10 through 12. This trilogy is an answer to the question, what if everyone's imagination runs wild? The answer? Terrorists will try to nuke it. In the trilogy... Whoa! What is this place? This is Imagination Land. The boys are whisked away to Imagination Land, where every imaginary thing thought up by anyone exists and lives free. Fellas! Fellas, wait! Uh, hold on, fellas! Butters! Don't leave me, fellas! Come back! But when the boys leave Butters in Imagination Land on accident, a war breaks out between the good and bad side of Imagination Land. The bad side of Imagination Land, populated by everyone's worst nightmares, goes wild, and when Isis finds out, they offer aid to destroy everyone's imagination. Now all of Imagination Land is ours! Not all, foolish orc. There are still parts of Imagination Land we don't control. There are very few South Park storylines that are deemed worthy of being expanded out into two-part episodes, let alone three. So you know Matt Stone and Trey Parker really had a story to tell with this one. This isn't one of those episodes that try to make a brilliant social commentary about the world. The smartest message to come out of this one is imagination good, terrorists bad. It's just a ridiculously funny and fun episode that doesn't make you think. 
The terrorists appear to have complete control of our imagination. It's only a matter of time before our imaginations start running wild. This episode has yet another storyline we can file under episodes that showcase the immense suffering of butters for your viewing pleasure. It's hilarious that the most innocent person in the whole town of South Park has throughout the series been through the most excruciating trauma, but this episode brings it to a head. Can I go now? Yeah, I'm on the cell phone. Could you get me out here? Butters is stranded in a non-existent land and forced to fight alongside Luke Skywalker and Goldilocks to prevent domination of the bad side of Imagination Land and Isis. The other storyline among the boys that runs throughout the trilogy is Cartman and Kyle's bet. We had a deal, Ka! Just get out of here! You signed an agreement, Ka! I don't care if I signed an agreement! <laughs> At the beginning of the episode, Kyle says he will suck Cartman's boy parts if he proves to be telling the truth about a leprechaun he spotted. You've got everyone believing your stupid story. It isn't a story, it's true. I saw a leprechaun. Of course, the leprechaun is real and Cartman insists Kyle follow through on his word, getting more and more impatient as the storyline progresses. Eventually, a US military official must force Kyle to do the unspeakable deed when Cartman refuses to help the army in their mission to save the US from terrorists attacking from Imagination Land unless Kyle follows through. I'm not going to spoil the gripping plotline of Cartman trying to get Kyle to suck his manly bits, but let's just say it's a story more dramatic and poetic than a Shakespearean tragedy. Imaginary things are real, huh? Guess that means I did win the bet after all. And you know what that means, Gav. Man, I do not want to meet the kid that dreamt those things up. Come on down South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 2. In Sheepshin. Season 15, Episode 10. In 2010, one of the most complex sci-fi movies in history premiered. The world was split into two groups by the Inception fandom. Those who loved the movie, and those who weren't smart enough to get it. Going to multiple dream levels sounds like a really stupid idea. You just don't get it because you're not smart enough. Let's move! So naturally, South Park had to parody it. In Sheepshin begins when Stan realizes he has a hoarding problem after his girlfriend Wendy points out how cluttered his locker is. Friends are worried that I'm showing signs of hoarding. Hoarding? Okay, what's that? Mr. Mackey has a similar problem with his mess of an office, and after everyone discovers that a barn owner down the street has been hoarding, red herding, sheep. The three hoarders, well, two hoarders and one herder, go to hypnotherapy. All right, everyone. We are all here to face the disease of hoarding together. The goal is for them to all go into their own subconscious and find the root of their hoarding tendency. But when Mr. Mackey's memory is too traumatic, it sucks both Stan and the sheep herder in, and they can't escape Mackey's subconscious mind. What? Whoa, wait, what am I doing here? Shh, be quiet! Excuse me, where are we? Shh, you gotta be quiet! Billy Thompson's out there! What the hell's going on? What the- I'd argue this episode is one of the funniest in South Park history, with its completely ridiculous premise. Characters beatbox to create background music whenever someone explains something so complex and cool. Pinkerton, you explain the logic and I'll provide the background. Alright. Look, it is possible to enter into someone else's dreams. And there's a special and debatably unnecessary appearance from Freddy Krueger. We need you, Fred. Like you needed me to kill those teenagers to stop the Russians? We had a country to protect! Essentially, it begins with the premise of an episode of Hoarders and then becomes the most South Parky South Park episode ever. South Park is one of the most self-aware shows on TV today, and this episode is probably the best example of that. Stan's mom, Sharon, acts as the eyes of the audience as she keeps pointing out how unnecessarily complicated and convoluted the plot of the episode is. Just because an 
idea is overly convoluted and complex doesn't make it cool. Simultaneously poking fun at how unnecessarily complex Inception is. But it just keeps on getting more and more ridiculously complex and decidedly uncool leading up to the gem of a line, it's like a taco inside a taco within a Taco Bell that's inside a KFC within a mall that's inside your brain. A taco inside a taco within a Taco Bell that's inside a KFC within a mall that's inside your brain! Come on down to South Park and meet some friends of mine. Number 1. Sarcastable. Season 16, Episode 8. What if football players threw a balloon around and wore bras over their shirts? Dad, do we really have to wear bras? Yes, Dan, this is what people want. Don't worry, you look really cool. I got the balloon, Coach Marshall. What should I do with it? If you have been kept up at night wondering the answer to this question, then you're in luck. When Randy finds out kickoff has been banned from school football games for safety reasons, he goes on a sarcastic tangent which the school board takes seriously. We don't have kickoffs anymore. Huh? The school said they're the most dangerous place so they don't have us do them anymore. Wait, 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 whoa! This starts a movement towards replacing football with Randy's sarcastic ball idea, and eventually Randy ends up coaching a Denver Broncos team clad in women's undergarment. I can't wait to talk sarcastic ball because it's really compelling. Joining me now is the coach of the Denver Broncos and the inventor of sarcastic ball, Randy Marsh. South Park has been known to be very fair and balanced when discussing pressing issues within episodes. Well, as fair and balanced as parody can be. They show both sides of any given issue that they are parodying in an episode no matter the opinions of the writers and producers. He's giving the balloon to Woodley. The referee comes in. Oh, the referee is calling that a touchdown. Oh, wait, now another official is signaling that's a safety. Oh. This episode demonstrates that perfectly. It begins with the boys watching a football game in which the players have suffered so much brain damage throughout their careers that they stop in the middle of the game to bake a non-existent cake in the middle of the field. Oh, and old surehand Mike Taftill, who seems to be baking an imaginary cake, Dan. And attempt to drive home in an imaginary car, even though their license was revoked a year ago. Ever since his concussion in 06, he doesn't even have a license. Coach Martin's coming over to tell him that now, but Jackson appears to think he's in a car driving home. But what's the alternative? Players competing in balloon tag while simultaneously trying to out-compliment each other? <laughs> Excuse me, pardon me, you guys look terrific. Wow, this game is great! Thank you. Hey, dude. Hey. You alright? Yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna be okay. Okay. 